welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering you. Any baseball fans, World Series watchers this last week or so? Not many. Okay. <laughs> the reason I ask, in case you don't know, is that the Giants won. And uh, although they won, the city of San Francisco, not so much, okay? Uh, it's kind of crazy, isn't it, what people do in celebrating the love, supposedly, that they have for their team. And we see this a lot now, where they do all these crazy, damaging things. Some of you probably saw this at the recent holiday on Friday. In fact, here's somebody's house that was all decorated up. I mean, people go crazy over this sort of stuff. A number of us were up at the Rio Rancho thing, and here's what I recorded the other night. Is this guy crazy or what? Who knew you could take a thing of PVC, some plywood, and a couple of trash cans and, and make music? But my point here today is that there's a lot of crazy things that people do out in our world in terms of celebration. Today we're going to look at a guy who the ancient city of Corinth thought was crazy because of some of the things that he was doing with his life. His name, of course, is the Apostle Paul. Paul says this about himself, because he was a rising star in the first century of the Jewish world, and he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, he said. A real Hebrew if there ever was one. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. As for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Wow. I mean, this guy was the Jew of Jews when it came right down to it. The Pharisees of Pharisees. But then something happened. Something that caused this guy who was zealous for his faith, the Jewish faith, to totally forsake it. To forsake his family, his faith, his reputation, all that he had worked all of those years of his life for, for something else. And to a certain extent, people thought he was a fanatic. So much so that they ultimately killed him because of his devotion to this cause. And it caused me this week to ask myself a question that I would encourage you to ask yourself. Is there anything in your life that you would be willing to die for. Now, for a number of us, we might say that of our family. You know, we would die for our spouse or we would die for our children. But how many of us really and truly would be willing to, be to die for what we believe in, for our faith? That's this guy, Paul, that we're taking a look at today. And we're going to read more from him in the uh, second letter to the Corinthian church. That's 2 Corinthians 5. And I'm going to read to you starting in verse 11, if you'd like to join with me. Reading out of the ESV today, or if you have our Bible app, it's already ready for you to go on there under follow. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might not no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. 
From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise God. Paul starts off by talking about what is, for many of you, a familiar phrase. And he says, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is used at least 25 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament. 25 times. Some of you might know one of those phrases. The fear of the Lord is... The beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, several associated with the fear of the Lord. But it's my belief that Paul's not tracking back to an Old Testament concept with this. He's really tracking back to what he's just said in verse 10. Look back at what we read and right before it in verse 10. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. For, for Paul, that was the fear of the Lord. The judgment day was coming. The day when all would stand before their God, before their creator, and have to give account for whether they had done good or whether they had done evil. That, for Paul, was the fear of the Lord. And for Paul, certainly, and hopefully for us as well, knowing the fear of the Lord drove him from sin and towards Christ, towards God. Paul says, call me crazy, but the reason we persuade others is we want them to know that. We want them to know the fear of the Lord. He tells the Corinthians, I'm not commending myself, I just want you to remember my story. Many of them in the church at Corinth had heard firsthand from Paul how his life was radically changed. That one day he was sent on a mission while he was still strong in the Jewish faith. And he was headed to a town called Damascus. And the mission he had there was to arrest, kill if necessary, anyone who claimed to be a follower of Christ. And he was the man for the hour. But on the way... Jesus stopped him in his tracks. Put yourself there for a minute. You're on this mission to kill all of the followers of this guy, Jesus. This guy that you know was crucified in the flesh and died. In fact, some of these radicals are saying that this guy is alive, that he rose from the dead. No way he's going to believe that. But as he's going, he's knocked to the ground, it says. And he has this personal encounter with the living Christ. A personal revelation from Jesus. A time when Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus actually called him Saul because his name had not been changed at that point for you Bible scholars out there. But the reality was he was getting Paul's attention. Why are you doing this thing? Wow, talk about stopping you in your tracks. This changes everything. All that they've said about this guy is true. He has come back to life. And here he is right before me. It changed the very course of Paul's life. Part of what Paul is saying is others are boasting maybe about the signs and wonders that they're doing in the name of Jesus. But his point to them is, this is about the change in my heart. That's why I do what I do, because he changed me from the inside out. That's why I do it. It's from my heart. Paul knew 
the fear of the Lord personally. And he knew that judgment was coming to all men. And part of what motivated Paul is he wanted to introduce all men to the love of Christ. He wanted them to know the love of Christ for themselves, the way that he had discovered the love of Christ for himself. In our verse 14 here in the passage, Paul wrote, the love of Christ controls me. This word is so powerful in the original that I just had to share it with you. Sinicho means to hold together, associate, take, hold, press, detain, grip, compel. Those are all different ways this word could have been translated. The writers of the theological lexicon of the New Testament make this statement, which I think is so powerful. It says, all of the meanings should have a part in the love of Christ that constrains us. This love suggests that the Lord seizing us to hold us and maintain us in his sovereign and exclusive possession. It takes possession of us so forcefully that it compels us to love in return and wraps up our whole being. More than pressure, it's a compulsion that orients our whole life and all of our conduct. That's a crazy love right there. That's why they were calling Paul crazy. Is he was on fire for the Lord throughout his entire being. He wasn't being compelled as much as he just felt he had to do this. Because of the love of God that controlled him. Wow, again this week I had to ask myself, do I have that same kind of passion, that same kind of love of Christ that compels me to do what I do? And I would say at least in part I do. But I don't know the fullness of this in the way that Paul does. I want that for myself. I hope you want that for yourself too. That you know his love, this crazy love, so deeply that it just moves you and compels you to do everything that you do. To love him in return sacrificially. Amen. Paul also said in that same sentence, he says that one has died for all. Part of what drove him, part of what compelled him and controlled him was this idea that Christ, this one, had died for all. Paul, in his uh, writings to the Romans, our chapter 5, verse 12, made this statement. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, he says. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Now, let me kind of unpack that a little bit here. Basically, what this is telling us is that Adam was the personal representative for mankind. And because Adam chose to disobey God and he ate from the tree that God said, leave that tree alone, all of mankind became guilty of disobedience before God because of what the one guy Adam did. Now, I've got to tell you that that was one of the hard things for me at first in Christianity because I'm the kind of person I don't like to be held responsible for what somebody else does. Anybody else relate to that? I mean, I was the kid in school when the teacher tried to punish the whole class for what little Johnny had done. Hey, I'm not going there. That's Johnny's deal, not mine, right? I'm not going to write on the board 50 times or whatever it is you think I should do, right? Because I don't want to be held responsible for what somebody else did. But can I tell you, in this case, it's a good thing. In fact, it's a great thing that God chose to do it that way. Paul goes on in Romans 5 to say this. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So even though, as the theologians like to say it, sin was imputed to us, because of Adam, 
because that was done by one, it only took one, Jesus, to fix the whole problem so that all of us could be made righteous. That's why it's such a great thing. And then he says the rest of this that I want you to drill in on, that he died for all. For all. For us. For you. For me. He died for the homosexual. He died for the fornicator, the adulterer, the pornographer, the abuser, the murderer, the rapist, the thief, the drunk, the glutton, the addict, the prideful, the liar, the idolater, the blasphemer. He died for them all. Did I leave you out? If I did, I'm sorry, okay? I tried to cover the whole gamut. Because many of us were once those people. Maybe some of you still are. God is telling you today that's no longer who you should be. Because he died to set you free from that, regardless of your sin. One man dying for all should be a game changer for you. Let me go beyond that. It should be a life changer for you. If that hasn't radically changed your life, then you need to ask yourself, what's wrong? Why is it that I don't get this? Why am I not understanding how big a deal this is? Because I will one day have to stand before the Lord. I will know the fear of the Lord personally. I will have to give an account. But because of the love of Christ that I know, I'm not going to be held responsible for my bad behavior. That is if the blood of Christ has covered your sin. And the only way that can be true is if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, boy, the fear of the Lord is a whole different matter, is it not? I see three expectations here in this passage that God, through Paul, is bringing to us. And how we live out the fear of the Lord in the love of Christ. The first expectation I would point you to is that we would live for Him. Paul repeats it again. He died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised. As crazy as this sounds, Jesus' hope, his expectation for you is that because he died for you, that you would live for him. Crazy, huh? But he thinks it's a big deal. Do we? Do we see it as as big a deal as he does? Because his hope is that our life agenda would become his agenda. His hope is that our gifts and talents would be used for his glory rather than our own. That's what he means in us living for him. Did you guys catch that part of that song about taking up our cross? That's this idea, that we're dying to ourself and our own agenda and pursuing what God has for us. The second thing that I see as an expectation here in this passage is that we would become new people. A very familiar verse to some of you, verse 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We would have new life. That'd be a great name for a church. I, you know, I, I, I'm just thinking. <laughs> but God has given us a new identity. Who we were is no longer who we are. Those old habits are being put away, and we're forming new habits, godly habits, ones that honor God rather than dishonor Him. That's the new creature. That's the new person, the new life that God is calling us to. The third expectation I see from here is that we would become His ambassadors. Verse 18, Paul said, Christ reconciled you to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We all have ministries. We have a ministry to our family. We have a ministry to uh, our church. But all of us have this as our primary ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. Because God wants us to become like Paul in our part of the world. In our families. In our neighborhoods. In our workplace. In fact, even me. I'm trying to work on that guy we saw at the park. You know, see if I can, you know... No, no, no. I mean, Sandy obviously knows the Lord. But my point to you with saying that is this. I often miss not being out there. 
I miss the challenge of being that tool, that instrument in God's hand to reach those people who don't know the fear of the Lord or the love of the Christ. And what a glorious thing you have if you're mindful of it. Becoming his ambassadors. Praising him as we persuade others to know him. To know the fear of him. And more importantly, to know the love of Christ. I get that there's problems that we're going to face. In fact, one of the biggest problems, I think, is that the fear of the Lord is largely lost on our world today. Would you agree? I mean, more and more people are mocking God, mocking a belief in a judgment day or the fact that you would stand and have to give an account, you know, about your behavior before a creator God. More and more people have no fear in their mind, at least, about that. And worse, they mock those of us who do as being unloving and uncaring about others. Others falsely understand the love of Christ. That's another problem that we face. Even in churches today, people falsely understand this. The view now in so many places is of God as this liberal, permissive parent that says, oh, whatever makes you feel good, just do it. I love you, right? Because God loves everybody. This past Tuesday, there was an AIDS benefit in New York City. And I don't know how many of you saw this, but Elton John, the musician, was there. And he praised Pope Francis for what Elton views as a relaxed stance by this pope on practicing homosexuals. Now, Elton John is saying this in response to the fact that the pope was recently asked in an interview, what do you think about same-sex marriages and about homosexuality? And the pope's answer was, who am I to judge them? That was how the pope answered that question. Elton said this of Pope Francis at the concert, He, the Pope, is a compassionate, loving man who wants everybody to be included in the love of God. It is formidable what he is trying to do against many, many people in the church. By the way, that's kind of talking about some of us right there, right? He is courageous, he is fearless, and that's what we need in the world today. Make this man a saint now, okay? Is what Elton John persuaded of the Catholic Church and the crowd. Now, what might surprise some of you is to hear me say the Pope is right. It's not his place or your place or my place to judge anyone else. I would also tell you that Elton John is right. Everyone, even the homosexuals that he's referring to, are included in the love of God. So both of them are right, but let me also say this, both of them are wrong if they think that because of that, that they won't have to stand before God and give an account someday, and that if they're not in Christ and covered by his blood, that God is going to somehow turn a blind eye to it. He's not. That's not the God of the Bible. You know, I have people every once in a while say, well, you know, homosexuality is condemned in a sin in the Old Testament, but Jesus never talked about it. Well, it's not that it's not talked about in the New Testament. My encouragement is go read Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us what happens there. That they've traded the truth about God for a lie. And as a result, God has turned them over to their passions. But then he says this in Romans 2, and this is important for you and I to hear. We know that God and his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Paul's point is, don't just pick on that sin because you got your own stuff. Take the log out of your own eye there. And then he goes on and makes, I think, a very important point for us. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? If we do not turn from our sin, then we are still in our sins. And the blood of Christ isn't covering us. And to a certain extent, I believe that we're treating the blood of Christ as it's something that's common and unholy. 
There was no big deal that Jesus died on a cross. God understands that I have my thing. God understands that you have your thing. God loves you, but God loves you enough to help you understand that's not right for you. That God has something that's so much better for you. And he wants you to turn to and receive that. And the church today needs to stand up and stick with what the Word of God says. I guarantee you that's not going to make you popular, though. And back to this idea of being an ambassador, for many of us, it's going to mean being like a foreigner working in a foreign land. It seems like people we talk to don't even speak the same language. Do you ever feel that way? Right? They don't even understand what I'm saying. And I'm not even sure I understand what they're saying either. But might I remind you that Hebrews 13 tells us this world is not our permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. If you're in Christ, you are not of this world. This world's government is not your final authority. Your final authority is in a world beyond this world. It's his agenda that you're supposed to be about, not this world's agenda. Doesn't matter what our current world is saying, It matters what the Lord of God is saying. I think one of the hardest parts for some of us is as we go out there, people are going to think you're a fanatic. That's ironic because that's not a problem like if you're a a sports fanatic, right? Or if you go gaga over Lady Gaga, which to me is a whole other weird thing, right? Okay? Okay. But if, you, if you're fanatical about celebrities or sports stars or a sport team, wow, there's nothing wrong with that. But just don't go there if you're going to be talking about God, right? We don't want you fanatical about God. Call me crazy, but I'm fanatical about God. I hope people call you crazy for being fanatical about God. Because again, we're not of this world. But what this world needs is they need people who will help them understand the fear of the Lord and more than that, drive them to a place of understanding the love of Christ. In fact, there's something crazy we're going to do here today. We're going to celebrate the death of our God. As somebody told me the other day, you know, no other religion does that. I mean, think about it. What other religion celebrates the death of their God? But we do as Christians because the death of our God paid for the penalty of our sins. But our God didn't stay dead either. (laughs) And that's why he's God, okay? If he'd been mad, man, he would have stayed dead unless God brought him back to life. But because he is God, he's alive. That's the reason Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. That's the reason that God still enters into your life and my life if we seek him. And we come together to do something crazy. To celebrate his death and his resurrection. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I want you to call us crazy, Lord. I, I want to be crazy like Paul. I want the love you have for me, Jesus, to control me, to compel me, to move me in such a way that I'm not afraid, that I'm willing to go out and be the ambassador that you want me to be, that others would see the new life that I have, that it would be lived out in its fullness and its completeness the way you desire for it to be lived out. Father, I recognize this sounds crazy even to some hearing me say this right now. But it's my hope that you would set them free today. That today would be a day of salvation for some as they would come to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Just like Paul did. That they would have this radical life-changing experience as they acknowledge you, Jesus, for who you are. The son of the living God. The one who was sent to take away our sin. If that's you right now, I pray that you would ask God for forgiveness that you would tell God that you believe, you believe that he sent his son Jesus to die and that three days later he rose again from the dead so that you could have eternal life. Father, for the rest of us who've already accepted that, I pray that it becomes a serious thing for us, a major thing for us. Not a we did that so many years ago thing, but something that truly moves us today and every day. 
And Father, may you be pleased in seeing how crazy we are for you. And we all pray that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.